communication otherwise. Thank you. So, we're going to start the day by talking about security. Serious, serious things. Seriousness, yes. I'm from Finland, I'm serious, and that's why my talk is serious as well. We don't really smile there. How your PHP application can get hacked and what you can do to prevent that from happening is the title of my talk. A couple of words about me first, so you know who on earth is talking in here and why am I talking to you about security. My name is Antti Rossi. I come from Finland and by trade I'm an IT entrepreneur. So I've been running my own company for the last six or seven years roughly and basically main focus of my days has been developing software, a lot with PHP, Laravel, vanilla PHP, JavaScript, all kinds of web technologies. In the recent couple of years, however, I've also sort of stepped into, into the cybersecurity scene, and I'm nowadays an of offensive security certified professional. I'm trying to remember how that how that word goes. So I'm basically one foot in development and the other foot in penetration testing and information security. And that gives me a sort of unique perspective, I would argue, regarding PHP and security. When you have a PHP developer and a hacker in the same box. That's why I'm here. Now I strongly believe that the fate of our users is in our hands as developers and admins. It's simply not feasible to expect for the majority of projects that you would have special security personnel available. When our clients, our bosses, our, our users mostly, first and foremost our users, when they use software that we have built, they expect it to be secure. They don't really care who makes it secure, but usually it's, it's you get the spec, you get, you get to build it, you get to test it together hopefully before you release, that's usually a good, uh, good thing to do. And then you get to maintain it, you get to run it in production. There's no specified step usually where you would have some magician testing and making sure that everything is secure. And if no, something wasn't secure, you could blame somebody else. No, that doesn't happen usually. So it's all on us. If we write our code properly, and if we know how to deal with PHP and security, stuff is gonna go pretty well. On the other side, if we don't, our users are going to be in trouble. So our users, clients, and employers expect that we know about security. And that's why I'm really, really happy to be here today talking to you about security. Now, hackers on the other hand, let's look at the hacker's perspective. Hackers love edge cases and quirks of technologies. As a developer, most of the time you're, you're really thinking about the user flows of the, of, of the user stories and the designs and specs that you're working with. So you focus on things going the way they should go, where on the other hand, hackers think completely, completely different. And that's why when a hacker looks at an application, we're constantly thinking, if you're a pen tester in an engagement, for example, you're constantly thinking to yourself, how can I break this application in a way that the developers have never even thought of? Are there some features, new features or old features in these languages or frameworks that the original authors have no idea about that I could use against them. That's how a hacker thinks. Uh, thinks. And that is specifically why we as the developers need to know about these specifics. They might not be useful for building features faster, but you're gonna see in a minute what I'm talking about and why they are super, super important to know about. So here's the deal. If you know the basics of hacking, I urge you to hack yourself first before somebody else does. When you hack yourself first, you have a chance to do that in a controlled environment where no data is going to get breached, nobody is going to get hurt, no one is going to get fired, and you get to patch those vulnerabilities before an actual malicious actor exploits them. And that's going to be the core idea of this talk. So I want that you walk away from this talk having a couple of new ideas and a lot of motivation to learn more about PHP and security. That's my goal of this talk. Before we go into the actual hands-on examples, however, there's a disclaimer that we always must have. I am not endorsing anyone to hack anyone else's websites. As a rule of thumb, that is illegal. 
Now, I don't know about laws in other countries except Finland, really, but especially in Finland, even, even trying to hack somebody else's website will get you in jail, even if you don't succeed. So even if you don't know what you're doing and you go out doing stupid stuff like this, you're, you're going to get in jail. So please don't do that. The reason we go through hands-on examples is that hacking and these vulnerabilities and exploiting them should not be taboos. We as developers need to exactly know what it looks like, what the hackers do, and when they succeed, what, what happens? How can we detect that? Because if you know about that in very, very specific details, then you're helpless. Well, one might ask then, if you get some good tips from here and you get excited, you want to learn hacking, where can I practice this then? If I can't just randomly go around and attack servers and companies out there, ah, said I'm practicing like that. So that's an excellent question. You can download these examples from my GitHub page. You can find the link there from my Twitter. My Twitter is, well, I'm not going to pronounce it. You can read it from there. Or if those examples are not enough, there are certain brilliant services out there online, such as Hack the Box. It's a Greek company that provides a free set of vulnerable machines, some of them PHP, some of them other technologies, where you can practice these skills in a controlled lab environment without breaking the laws or causing harm to anyone. Okay, let's get our hands dirty. Majority of you have most certainly heard about SQL injection, I would expect, since you're here. We're going to look in SQL injection next deep down in SQL injection. There's actually also no SQL injection, by the way. So no SQL doesn't mean no problems in this context either, like it doesn't in many other contexts. In SQL injection attacks, the attacker injects malicious queries, malicious SQL queries into some form of an input device. And in our case, it's most usually is going to be HTTP requests, since we deal with web a lot with PHP. And if SQL injection attacks, if they succeed, majority of the time you get the whole database content out through that hole. All of your data because of one single mistake. Now here's a very basic example. This is using Eloquent, which is Laravel's uh, ORM. Hopefully you've heard about don't pass unsanitized variables in raw queries, blah, 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 all of that basic jargon that uh, hopefully when you get started with PHP, you get taught. Now, this is one example that will make you vulnerable to SQL injection. But the problem is that certain edge cases can be really, really hard to test and hard to, hard to find. You don't necessarily spot them in code reviews because SQL injections, when they happen in the wild and big companies get trouble because of those, those vulnerabilities, they are not easy to spot. And that's the problem. Because there are certain edge cases when you have highly abstracted and nested code around your repository classes, for example, that you just simply can't spot in a code review unless you're a, a, like a specific PHP penetration tester or something. That they're sometimes really, really hard to spot. The biggest danger, however, usually lies within our attitudes. So it's, it's not even the biggest problem is not even that they're sometimes hard to spot but these are some, some quotes that I've either personally thought or said out loud in the past or that I've heard some, some developers say out loud. So in certain cases, you might have an API endpoint that theoretically might be vulnerable to SQL injection, but a developer might say that, but there's, um, we're not even returning errors, so there's no way for you to do anything with it, even if it was vulnerable, because there's no data coming back. How can you get data out when there's no data coming back? I've heard people argue that and try to sell themselves why this is not a problem. Another case, and this was actually my thinking from th three years ago before I got into penetration testing and, and cybersecurity. I was thinking that, man, if, even if you have a vulnerability, which is really, really hard to find, really hard to exploit, there theoretically, no one would exploit it if it takes you a year to get anything out of it. Because sometimes, Exploiting blind SQL injection vectors are super, super hard to do blindly. That's what I thought. But guess what? I had never even seen what the SQL injection actually looks like when somebody performs it. And SQL injections are actually really easy to test for with proper tooling. So 
it's not only us, the developers, that use tools. Hackers have their own frameworks and tools as well. And the tools that test for SQL injection also make the exploitation process really easy for you. And we're going to do that next, here. So I will show you what I mean, because I truly believe, personally, my eyes opened when I saw this thing happen for the first time. That's why I believe it's not enough that we just talk about these things theoretically. So to make our life a little bit easier, I pre-recorded this last night. You can see well prepared there. Multiple weeks in beforehand. So within this example application that you can also download, we have a very simple API endpoint. So it's returning JSON. Nothing fancy in here. You can see there is a URL param. Can you actually see this laser? Yeah? yeah. That's pretty cool. I've never used this before. So yeah. OK, nice. There's a URI param, URI param called sort that takes in a string value. And you can specify a column to sort the data by, basically. So very basic stuff. Now, the developer of this application, however, probably for convenience reasons, you can see if you specify minus and the name of the column, it inverts the sorting order, which, surprise, surprise, represents exactly how raw SQL queries work, for example. So hacker, when they see that, they might think, oh, there could be a raw SQL query behind this API endpoint. Now, we're going to be using a tool called SQL Map. I hope you can see the font because I can't actually zoom it a little bit, uh, a lot because it's a, it's a video. So SQL map takes in the URI, uh, sorry, the URL of the endpoint we want to test together with the parameter that we found. The only thing we need to do besides that, just to make it a little bit faster, we're going to tell it that the database management system is MySQL so that it doesn't test for MS, MSSQL and, and Oracle DB because we, we happen to know, we just want that to go a little bit faster. And the batch flag says, don't ask any questions, just run. Now, this part of the video has been sped up 3,000% or something. So SQL map, what it does for us, it actually performs hundreds and hundreds of different types of tests against this API endpoint. And very well, in this video, in very fast, in reality, depending on the server's response times, it might take 20 minutes or so. It comes back with the result. And we can actually see that, yes, SQL map found three different injection style attacks that this endpoint is vulnerable to. And they're all blind, Boolean-based uh, Boolean blind, error-based blind, time-based blind. So we have a blind injection vector, very, very painful to exploit manually. In information security, if you, claim, if you go and claim that there's a vulnerability somewhere, as a rule of thumb, you need to provide a working proof of concept. You need to prove that that vulnerability not only exists, but that it's exploitable. And that's the reason why SQL Map also does that part for us. So let's change the batch flag and say, tell us the current database of the application. And it starts running, running, running. Oh, OK. Vulnerable underscore app is the database that the application is running. Let's go deeper. Let's go into the database vulnerable app and ask for the tables. It's going to run. It's going to fetch them one by one. And it's going to come back with the tables. Now, obviously, just to go as deep as we can here, there's an interesting table called users. Let's have a look at that. Could we get the could we dump the contents of users with this tool without actually having the right single line of code or ha to hack anything manually? Yes, we can. We can get, like I said earlier, the whole database out through this hole without having to do anything manually. Now, a 12-year-old kid can use this tool. They can install this tool with Homebrew, Brew install SQL map on their Mac, Badam, run it and hack you. If you haven't tested your own API endpoints with this tool, and since it's so easy to use and so easy to hack stuff with, it's not an excuse that you don't know how to do it. Now you do. You've seen live how it happens. And that's usually a way how SQL injection vulnerabilities get exploited. 
The second exploit that we're going to look at and or vulnerability that we are going to exploit is called object injection. Now, raise your hand if you have heard about PHP object injection before in your career. Okay, less than 5% of the room. That's good and bad thing and news at the same time. Good news is that you're going to learn a lot from this next section. Bad news is that if you haven't heard of this, you most probably haven't been able to check is your application vulnerable to this. So we're going to go from far deserialization to remote code execution next. Quick theory lesson first, however, since we have some potentially foreign concepts, um, we have to mix quite many, not really complicated, but potentially weird PHP concepts together in order to uh, find this exploit and this vulnerability. So stream wrappers in PHP provide us with a really nice abstraction over different protocols, like RAR, SSH, FTP. In this context, we are going to be ex exceptionally interested in the far stream wrapper. That's going to be in the very core of this vulnerability. Now, far files are basically single file bundles that have a complete PHP application in them. Composer, for example, is distributed as a far file. So you download a single file, you have everything you need in it, you can run binaries out of it, you can version it, distribute it easily. So it's actually very similar to, you've probably at some point of your career used jar files in the Java context, for example. So far files, jar files, very, very similar concepts. And surprise, surprise, the far stream wrapper allows us to read PHP files from a PHP archive. That's what it's for. So it allows us to use FAR files within our code easily. <coughs> Read and write into them or, or from them. Now object serialization, which is the other part of this vulnerability, on the other hand means the process when you turn an object into a string. And obviously the other side of the process is the deserialization process where you turn that string back into an object. Now here's an example. Let's take this arbitrary class called logger that has a couple of attributes and a couple of methods in it. Let's new it up and print out the serialized version of this instance. This is what we get. So we get a string. Now, this string contains all the bits and pieces we need in order to put together that very same instance of this class that we serialize. So it has the name of the class that's being se that was serialized. It has all the properties of the class and their values and, well, their lengths. And that's basically all you need. No methods are included, however, in the serialized objects, which is actually a brilliant move security-wise, because that would be horrendous if you could actually just go there and manipulate the constructor of the object to do whatever, open a reverse shell to you when you knew up that class. That would be horrible. And the reason why it would be horrible is because when you deserialize an object, it's injected into your current application scope from where you do that deserialization from. And that's bad news if that object contains malicious code in it. And here's the catch number one. Even though we can't control the methods, of the object that gets serialized, there are two magic methods that get called nevertheless. First one is related to the process of deserialization, that's when the wake up is being called, and destructor, the object destructor is called just before garbage collection, when there are no more references to that object in the application runtime's memory, basically. So, in theory, if we could find a class that looks something like this. This is a very, very crude, overly simplified example to just highlight the point. If we could find a class that works something like this, so it would run some potentially dangerous function and we could influence the ar input arguments of that function using the attributes of that class. Now, that would mean if we have a serialized version of that objects in, uh, of an instance of that object. So if we have a serialized object like that, we could actually target this attribute that's been passed into the system call, and we could change it. 
And the very moment when you would unserialize this object in the application runtime's memory, this would happen. We would get code execution. Now, this kind of cases are so-called gadgets. So in exploit development, we call these gadgets. <coughs> and gadgets are basically chains. They're, they're, they usually come in chains, but they're pieces of code that allows us to circumvent some security measurements and execute something or read, read a file or write to a file usually. That's what we do with gadgets. Now here's the catch number two. PHP archives contain metadata which doesn't have to be but can be in a serialized format. And now this was the completely new part to me personally. Any file operation on the PHP archive will cause the PHP archive metadata to be unserialized. Or unserialized is the name of the function, but deserialized is the grammatically correct term to use for that. Any file operation. Now here are some file operations that you've probably used, hopefully, maybe. When I'm using these methods personally, or at least before I knew about this vulnerability, I would never ever imagine that there's any potential danger in calling file size on a file, regardless of what actually goes into that function. I personally couldn't imagine how could you exploit a function like file size. What can you do with it? It doesn't really, it doesn't execute anything that you could control. You can't hijack the control anyhow. But with the catch number three, with Farstream wrapper, it doesn't give a crap about what file types you pass into it. If it finds PHP archive within the input stream you pass into it, it's going to read it. Now if we put these pieces together, this odd puzzle of different contexts and concepts, if we take an image file, and we plant a, plant a malicious far file within that image, we hide it in it, we're going to call file size on that image, for example, which is a very common thing. If you have some, some web application with avatars, user avatars, for example, th there might be like a file size check within the uploader method, which usually gets called, for example. So getting this far is not really hard. The, the object that's, inject, uh, that's hidden in the metadata of our malicious archive is going to be injected in the application's runtime when that happens. And our gadget, if we have a working gadget at that point, the gadget is going to kick in on this truck, which usually happens immediately since there are very frequently there are no more references to those objects left in the memory. So the, the this structure just basically runs in the end of the PHP lifecycle before the response is returned. So this in theory is how an exploit would work. This in practice is how an exploit like that will work. I love the silence, everyone's freaked out. What are you doing? We'll be using a tool called PHP GGC for the generation of our payload. It's an open source tool, anyone can, can use it, anyone can download it. So PHP GGC allows us to easily create, surprise, surprise, gadgets and gadget chains. It has a set of ready-made gadget chains, so we don't actually even need to go and look for gadgets within our vendor dependencies manually. We'll be using this Guzzle remote code execution gadget in this example, and you can actually see it's, it's, uh, it's patched in the latest version of Guzzle, but it still exists in four months old version of Guzzle. So if you haven't updated your dependencies in four months, you are most likely running something vulnerable within production right now. It uses the destructure vector and because hackers are lazy, they bundle everything into this one tool so you can do from start to, uh, from, from beginning to end everything with this single tool. It also allows us to embed these payloads into images directly. Now how convenient is that? So let's take an image. I have an image of my cat here, obviously, 
because he's a bit malicious. So I like to use him as an example. His name is Monni. So a, a regular JPEG. There's nothing cheesy going on with the image. It's a, it's a basic image. So we'll pass that image into PHP GGC, specify our payload. And what we can control here is that we want that the gadget chain ends with a call to function called pass through, which works exactly the same as a system or shell exec in PHP does. And the input argument to this function is going to be ID, which if you know some Linux command line stuff is going to show us the current user ID of the user that's running the process. Then we pass in the image of Monni and we say that let's just call it ID.jpg, that malicious image that comes out. And it does its magic really fast. If we open that image in Chrome, you can see the image looks exactly the same. From the surface, you can't tell that there's anything going on with it. If you look at the stream content of that file, however, and you grep for guzzle, you can see that in the middle of that image lies our payload. That's our gadget chain. That's what's going to get injected into the application's current application scope if we manage to exploit this vulnerability. Now, there is an API endpoint for uploading files within this example application that you can download and play around with, which has all the basic file size validations, etc., in place. So you can see a regular file type validation won't do no good. It won't detect this. There's nothing wrong. It's a, it's a valid JPEG. So it goes through. Whoosh, success. Now there's another API endpoint where we can get some details of our uploaded files. And we'll pass in the name of the file into this method or into this API call. We can see in the response there are a couple of attributes like the size or last modified that could be using PHP files. Uh, file system methods. Hmm. Now I'm going to spoil this a little bit and just show you the code before we actually run the exploit so you know what is what is actually happening under the hood here. So yes, it's it is calling file system size which and, and file system last modified which resolves under the hood into the actual PHP file size call. So we can see that this is a vulnerable vector or a very potential vector. Oh no. Now, instead of passing in the plain image name like we just did, let's see what happens when we pass in a far stream wrapper prefixed name of an image. Oh no. Before the JSON output starts, we see the output of our comment. So we have remote code execution on the machine. And trust me, it gets even worse. What the hacker does, the very first thing they do when they get remote code execution, is that they, they want to have a shell. They want to start an actual shell. And usually you can start that. Or always there is a way to start that if you get remote code execution. Now this example is running in a Docker container, so that's why I'm writing a Docker uh, alias here. Let's trigger a TCP connection from the target machine using netcat. It's going to dial back to our attack attacking machine to port 1337 and with the E flag we're going to pass in a bash shell into that TCP connection. We'll call that image reverse.jpg. It's the very same image, image of Monni again. We'll just upload it to our example application. Identical process. Now, in another pane, before we actually trigger this exploit, we have to start the listener so that we're ready for the incoming reverse shell connection. So we'll use netcat on our end as well to open a listener. So we'll be listening on all interfaces and port 1337. It's going to be a TCP listener. Then let's trigger the exploit. And now you don't, you don't see anything. It doesn't actually tell you, even on Mac for some reason, that a new connection came in. But if we start to issue comments into this Netcat listener, the server responds back. And we have a shell. So basically, that server 
got pretty much completely owned through this one simple mistake that the developers were not checking and sanitizing there is no reason for you to be able to pass in slashes into file name attributes for example simple mistake dramatic results absolutely dramatic results now you're probably thinking well okay that's that's pretty bad that's pretty bad let me tell you it's going to get even worse it's going to get even worse the last section or the last exploit before we start to quickly go through some countermeasures against these attacks are going to be about a technique called privilege escalation in privilege escalation the attacker exploits a bug a design flaw or a configuration flaw to access resources that they should not have access to like you saw from the reverse shell yes we had shell to the machine but we're, we're, we're not satisfied yet we're not admins yet we're not root we want to be root usually when you're escalating privileges if you don't have an admin hash or you don't have an admin password there's simply no way for you usually to start the new admin process so it's much easier to find an already running process with sufficient privileges and exploit that so find something that's already running as root and exploit it and if you manage to hijack the execution flow of that process without crashing it you can redirect it anywhere you want you can redirect it into a new shell for example now for this exact reason very few things should ever run as root on your host machine production machines your host machine staging machines any machine very very few things should ever run as root now your scheduler and queue workers are most certainly not one of these things the problem is however when you spin up a new virtual private server depending on the cloud provider by default some of them ssh you in with root access and if you don't explicitly set up user accounts with different privileges and set this up running with those privileges you're accidentally going to execute stuff as root and that's a problem and we're going to find out why so we'll continue from where we left so we have a shell so we open the listener again we just restart the shell now don't worry about these comments unfortunately we don't really have time to go through everything I would love to this would take the whole day this presentation but we are going to have to configure our shell to actually behave like an actual shell since it's it's just a random TCP connection that doesn't really have all the benefits of shell you can't use arrow keys you can't use interactive comments and stuff so in a nutshell what we're doing in here is that we're wrapping that shell in a Python PTY and then we're configuring some variables to make sure that our target machine and our local machine are in sync so that when we're running interactive comments each knows exactly how many columns and how many rows does our terminal have so that our output doesn't just get absolutely mingled so after those couple of quick hacks we can finally it even looks like a shell you can see from here we see the user and stuff we can actually run comments on the server and we can run comments such as vim which means we can edit files on the server now this example application is built using laravel and in laravel's context the laravel scheduler is being operated from a class called console kernel so we open the console kernel with vim and let's have a look are there any comments scheduled in here that we could tamper with okay the schedule method is empty we only have something that's commented out which looks like basic stock code basically now how the process of scheduling in this context works is that you either have a scheduled scheduled what, what on earth do you call it on windows scheduled service i think system service that runs the scheduler of your application that then in conjunction runs this stuff or in linux you're you're using the crontap system to to execute this very same same piece of code let's execute the command let's try what would happen now by the way as a rule of thumb if you can execute php you're going to find a way to execute system level comments as well most of the time there is a way for you to get there now scheduler makes it really easy for us because it has an exec method so we're like woo 
We don't even need to circumvent this. Let's try something that looks quite familiar. Let's see what happens if you run netcat from this scheduler and dial back to our attacker's machine, our machine, into a different port this time. Let's see what happens. Before we actually execute this, we're going to have to open a new listener, obviously, or a new tab. So we got the listener running. We're going to save the file on the server. And then let's wait. We know that the smallest interval that you can configure with Linux Crontab is once every minute. So the Linux Crontab runs once every minute. So let's wait for a minute to pass. Seven seconds. So we know that Crontab at least executes and reads the Crontab. Okay, so Crontab has executed. Now, depending on the configuration, most probably the application's scheduler class has already exe uh, also executed. And you can see we have shell access. But this time, we're not www data, we're root. Because the scheduler was configured to run in root's cron tab. So now we can say, as a hacker or a pen tester, now we're happy. The machine has been completely compromised. There's nothing you can do. If you get a domain controller or just a regular machine admin level user, you're screwed. It's, it's game over already. So the game should never go this far. But as an attacker, we were successful. <laughs> So the machine got absolutely smashed. Now, the important part, how do we make sure that what we just witnessed doesn't happen to us and our servers and our applications and our users in production? Rule number one, do not trust input of any format. You cannot be selective in your security best practices. You cannot think that Oh, because we're using, like I thought back in the day, there's no risk in calling file PHP file size, so why sanitize? If you can't hack through this, why bother? Only do it for the important parts. No, don't do that. Sanitize everything. Cookies, reading from files, everything. Because hackers find a way to tamper with the input, and if you're not prepared, that's going to cause some trouble. And also sanitize. So you can disarm code. You can disarm, remove certain marks from there to make the code not operate, basically. Tip number two, don't run outdated software in production. And now the concrete reason why this matters, like you saw within the Guzzle gadget chain example, you can't exploit an object injection vulnerability if you don't have a working gadget. Now, how do you make sure that there are no working gadgets within your application? You keep your application updated. If you don't update your application, it's most probably going to be full of working gadget chains. And that's only one vector and one problem. There's, there's, a, there's a myriad of other problems that this, like, come from not running patched versions of software out there. The whole web is full of exploitation scripts that anyone can Google Elasticsearch version, this and this, and just download the script and run it. And if you haven't patched your systems, they, they get in. Without even knowing what they're doing, they're going to get in. That's why security people talk about this all the time. Tip number three, and especially for beginners, well, for, for all of us, for, for all of us, this is super important. Do not run anything that you don't understand in production. A lot of examples that I found from Google. I've, I've, I have a lot of different examples. I, I always gather three or four different um, per speech. Usually, I, I have some examples with file uploads and bypassing file upload validations and stuff. And I've researched quite a bit of different ways to upload files with PHP, for example. And 30 to 40 percent of guides and tutorials out there, if you Google Laravel uploading files or Symfony uploading files, they focus only on the file uploading part and don't even mention the file type validation. And now what happens if a beginner goes out and finds those tutorials, copies the code, you're screwed. You're absolutely screwed. And the only reason is that you didn't, it worked, you copied something over and it worked, but you didn't know why. 
that's why you need to take time to actually understand what you're running. Copy pasting is fine if you understand every line. If there's a weird looking line and a weird looking function and you're like, I've never seen this function. I, I don't even know what it does, but this works. Let's ship it. That's probably, that line is probably there for that specific reason, because an attacker was thinking to themselves like, what features could I use that the developers don't even know about? And that's where the process starts from. Tip number four, follow the principle of least privilege. So instead of starting from root, you start from not having access to anything. Anything not having access to any place, basically. So you give processes and users, people, only the bare minimum access that they actually need. And you never give administrative access to anything. It's a very, very dangerous thing to do, like you just witnessed. So do not go take the shortcut and just make everything run as root, because then we don't have to worry about file permission problems and all of that nasty stuff. And that applies not only to your application in production, but also your staging environments, your own workstations. They are as vulnerable. If you run a vulnerable application on your laptop, your laptop is going to be vulnerable to that sort of attacks we just witnessed. So it's not just that one production server, it's all of your systems. You need to follow the same principles. And tip number five, I highly encourage developers to learn the basics of hacking and to learn to think about hacking. Because when I got introduced to the cybersecurity scene, I was gobsmacked because I expected that all the hackers and security personnel would have development background. And I went there, I went to conferences, I went to meetups and I was talking to people and uh, no, very few of them actually do. And they were like, what do you mean? What, developers like, no, we don't. We, we only code because we only go to code the bare minimum because we have to code. And I was like, oh, well, that, that's weird. Okay. Then I also noticed that there were no developers around in those conferences. And I've started to realize that there's actually a massive gap between the cybersecurity world and the community and the software development community. And that's why I'm trying to tie this gap sitting here between one leg in the different group and the other leg in different group and talk about these things. Because these should not be taboos. We as developers should know the basics of hacking. We don't need to be excellent hackers or certified pen testers or anything like that. It's enough that we know the basics, but we need to learn to think like a hacker. We need to know what's out there that we're fighting against. Closing words before questions. Sorry? Yes, yes. So I will publish the slides and there will hopefully also be a recording available if the te tech doesn't fail us, <laughs> like happened in the beginning of the talk. If there's only one or two things that you remember from this talk, please let it be these last slides. Security is not a one-time project or sprint or effort that you just do and say that now I'm secure or now my company is secure or my application is secure. Security is a process and a mindset. And it's an infinite process. And you have to pay attention to it every time you run code, you write code or you maintain code. And even if you don't touch the code, it gets outdated. So whenever there is code and you as a professional developer are involved, you need to take security in account. Security is never done. And it's not a matter of do you have enough of it. It's, it's a matter of what is the level of risk that you can handle. The risk is never zero, but you need to control that by working on this consistently. Every single day. Remember, <laughs> with great power comes great responsibility. You've learned some tricks. Like I said in the beginning of my presentation, the purpose of these tricks is to teach you how to write more secure code and how to keep your users and your customers and your clients safe. Do not use this information improperly. Use it well. Thank you.
do we have time for questions? Yeah. Do you have questions? You have one. Okay. You're gonna get the box from there. Okay. One two. Yeah, it works. Uh, yep. Have you checked if, for example, this files with the injection will pass the vi virus scanners of some kind or not? Um, have I checked? Yeah. What type of file scanners are you talking about? Well, let's say th this example JPEG with the far injection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So virus scanners will pass them or will will be screaming that something it, is wrong? It depends completely on the scanner. There are some scanners, like mail attachment scanners, for example, that do pick these things up, but you don't regularly use them in your applications. After I've, gi after I've shown these examples the first time, I think it was maybe in Madrid or Amsterdam earlier this year, people got a bit scared and they, a couple of uh, guys went out and actually built like libraries to do verification and validation for, for this sort of thing. So there are tools to check for malicious PHP archives within images. Yeah. But it's absolutely 50-50. Depends completely. Okay. So I need to check ClamAV then. Yeah. I th Clam AV. Cl Clam AV. Yeah. Clam AV, if I'm not mistaken, at least some versions of it do spot those things. Because this is what Google uses, so uh, yeah. Gmail, so it seems it may it work. Y it is pretty robust, yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks. Any other questions? I have a question. Is this uh, possible to remove this payload from the image, for example, by the Gini li library? Or otherwise, does g uh, manipulation with Gini library remove this payload? I don't see why not. Technically, yeah. And, and if you can detect it, if you can find it, with strings that easily. Of course, you don't know what to grab for if you don't know what's in the gadget chain. But I do believe that, yeah, you should be able to do that. It's not going to be very easy, but it's going to be doable, definitely. And that would actually be the best of both worlds. So you disarm the image, but the image still stays operational. So that, that would be a really good approach. I would say that removing uh, that, pay, pay, uh, that payload from the file would be too problematic. It's better to sanitize everything and... Yeah, well, uh, yeah, the best thing is not to... Like, when you find that there's something wrong with it, from security perspective, of course, the best thing is just to keep your hands away from it, like, throw it away. Like, don't touch it. Tell your users that whatever you're trying to do is not okay. Come back with the proper payload. But for usability reasons, that's not always possible. So it's a balancing act always. You can't go full security because security, if you go full on security, security becomes the enemy of usability and developer experience and life in general. So it's a, it's a balancing act, really, always. Any more questions? Oh, in the very back row, we have a gentleman there, and the box went the other way. Okay. <laughs> Uh, hey, uh, this uh, fire JPEG file does it need does it need uh, execution permission for it to, to work? If I upload it as JPEG and it doesn't have the the execution, would it still work as a, this with this fire protocol? I'm not hundred percent sure, but I would say yes because you're not technically executing that file. You're reading from that file, and the execution happens within your PHP process. So therefore. To my knowledge, you wouldn't. It, it doesn't really matter. Does the image have execution permissions or not? So, okay, thanks. Yeah. There's a question at the at the back. Okay, so just uh, to comment on the trying to catch those things, the list of the functions was pretty long. Yeah. So basically, any trying to catch those things in this file would actually execute that uh, composer and far metadata. So. Yeah. So th that's why what you need to do is that whatever you pass in into any function, not just file system functions, you should just sanitize it. So if you use Laravel's, let's say, or most of you have maybe heard, have heard about fly system um, storage driver, for example. So if you use fly systems storage driver abstraction, that, for example, by default strips out the slashes from your paths, which basically disarms all the stream wrappers. And that in itself is, is enough for you. It will never allow you to pass anything malicious, in this context malicious, into those functions. But I'm sure that this is not the only weird and complicated attack vector for PHP out there. 
This is just uh, something that has been recently surfacing again. There are most certainly vectors similar to this that publicly we don't know about, that only hackers underground know about. So that's why you have to sanitize everything, not just file system call arguments. Any other questions? No? All right, I think it's coffee time then. Thank you.